Hello and welcome to the Bloomberg Davos debate. I'm Mariam Namazi. It's a question contemplated by governments, investors, consumers amidst the struggle to contain the fallout from the financial crisis. Are big banks a cure or a curse for the global economy? Well, over the next hour, we'll seek answers to that question from our panel of bankers and regulators. But first, a taste of how the debate is already dividing opinion. The big banks are too big. They're not as nimble, and when they do go wrong, um, it's obviously going to be very, very big, big to recover. Breaking them up is the right thing to do. It's not going to affect the volume of money that goes out to SMEs. They, they have to be a force for good. What they do is a social good. It's clearly much better to design a financial system where there's, uh, you don't have any big banks which are too large to fail. They are very much a fundamental part of the global economy. We couldn't work without banks. You cannot expect the banks to solve the sovereign crisis on their own. The banks have been told to hold sovereign debt. If you double the capital requirement and you double the liquidity requirement, the available credit capacity in the industry shrinks. We criticise Japan for keeping alive uh, zombie banks. We're pretty much doing the same in the West. Banks um, are a cure and a benefit to the a capitalistic system, but they have to be regulated. The United States government owes $15 trillion. Where are they going to get the money from? It's clearly the case that any economy, Britain is no exception, needs a well-capitalized, vibrant, competitive uh, banking system that lends into the real economy. I want to get straight to our panel now. Joining us today, Jean-Claude Trichet, the man at the helm of the European Central Bank during the financial crisis, who worked to stem the panic, buying up covered bonds and boosting liquidity. Peter Sands, the chief executive of Standard Chartered, one of the few banks that actually grew profit throughout that same crisis. This lender operates in Asia, Africa and the Middle East. Nouriel Roubini, the man who predicted the crisis, the biggest since the Second World War, professor of economics and international business at NYU Stern School of Business. Mr. Roubini is also co-founder and chairman of Roubini Global Economics. You also have Luxembourg's finance minister, Luke Frieden. His country has retained its AAA rating, one of the few Eurozone economists to do so, economies to do so. Uh, but can it escape the fallout from the debt crisis? Adair Turner, Britain's top financial regulator. As chairman of the Financial Services Authority, Lord Turner oversees 29,000 financial firms. And Guillermo Ortiz, chairman of Barnorte, one of Mexico's biggest banks, and former governor of the country's central bank. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today. Mr. Trichet, if I can start with you, just explain a little bit about who benefits for a bank to be big. Well, uh, first, first of all, let me go back to what you said. We had to cope with, in the mid-September 08, with the uh, worst crisis since World War II, which could have been the worst crisis since World War I, and the crisis came from the uh, systemic fragility, systemic instability of the whole financial system. And we had the uh, revelation that the fragility was such that all the financial institutions, starting with the most vulnerable up to the less vulnerable, would fall, could fall down uh, like a house of cards. So we have to get that in mind because, of course, all what is done by the public authorities or what is done by the regulators, by the uh, G20, by the Financial Stability Board, by the Basel Committee, as well as by national regulators, can be criticized, can be put into question, can be uh, uh, challenged. But the fact is that we have no right to accept to be back to the fragility that we had observed and which could have been, again, the worst crisis since World War I. So it is absolutely necessary to have the right regulation and to concentrate on the big banks, which is not the right, uh, in my opinion, definition, because you know what counts are those banks that are systemically dangerous. Uh, they can be big, they can be uh, interconnected in a very intense fashion, they can be very complex, they can be in a way of, uh, that they provide the global economy uh, something which has no substitute. 
And all these criteria are necessary. But I would say what is necessary is for these banks that are systemic, systemically uh, dangerous, if I may, potentially dangerous, quote unquote, and has to be checked, both at the le national level and at the global level, we have to do what is required by the circumstances. Because again, we cannot put ourselves in the same situation as we were in 07, 08. And in my opinion, what is to be done has been already decided and is to be implemented by the international community is well done, well oriented, even if it is criticized, because of course it is entirely designed to have a system which would be much less fragile. I would say nobody would forgive us to let the system as fragile tomorrow as it were uh, three years ago. Well, let me just pick up on something you said there about uh, the definition of big uh, and the fact that big doesn't necessarily mean that it is systemically risky. Mr. Sands, what is your take on that? Uh, well, to start with, um, I think by most measures, uh, we wouldn't be considered in the realm of the global economy as being um, big. Um, and we're not even a G-SIFI. We're not even one regarded as being um, systemically important. Um, but I do think it's a, a, a dangerous um, line of thinking to equate being big with either being dangerous or being bad. Um, you can easily move from a situation in which you have banks that are too big to fail to having a banking system where the banks are too many to fail, where you have lots of small banks, but the net impact of what happens if they get into trouble is, is the same. Although Standard Chartered isn't a big bank in that sense, um, I do think uh, it's worth putting the case for big banks. Um, I don't think you can run the global economy international trade and payments, supporting the kind of infrastructure requirements we have around the world, um, supporting major corporations, building big projects, making deals with each other, that's not going to happen without substantial, sophisticated financial institutions. We're not going to have that happen with a cottage industry of smaller banks, which is not to say we shouldn't have smaller banks. They're part of the sort of biodiversity of the system. Um, but you need big banks as well. I also think there's a lot of misunderstanding about um, scale economies. If you build a big, overly complex bank with lots of unrelated businesses in a sprawling empire, it should be no surprise that you end up with something that doesn't have scale economies. But if you look at the underlying economics of the individual businesses of banking, they are absolutely subject to scale economies. And because of that, whether you like it or not, banks will get bigger the relentless economics, you get better risk diversification and better use of cost base. And that is good for customers and it's good for the regulatory system. The other observation I'd make is there is this sort of notion that the world economy is dominated by big banks. Actually, banking is a remarkably fragmented industry. The top 10 banks in the world actually control much a smaller share of banking assets than the top 10 companies in most other global industries. It's still a relatively fragmented industry. Well, just picking up on a point you made there about uh, the big banks and that the, the role they play within economies, Mr. Abini, what is your thought on that, that to some extent we do need the big banks uh, to serve the demands of government, society and economies? Well, we need a well-functioning financial system with banks and other financial institutions are providing a wide variety of financial services. But... Uh, to me, it's not clear why you should have under the same umbrella commercial banking, <clears throat> investment banking, prop trading, asset management, insurance, and so on. And what turned out to be the case in the last few years was that there were institutions that were systemically important, and their threat and collapse had systemic effects. Now, it might be too big to fail or too, big, uh, too complex to manage or too interconnected to fail, but we've seen what happens in this situation. And not only we had too big to fail financial institution, but as a result of the policy response, take the United States, consolidation in the banking system, they become even bigger to fail. JP Morgan took over Bear Stern and Washington Mutual. Bank of America took over Merrill Lynch and Countrywide. Uh, Wells Fargo took over Wachovia. So now our system is even more consolidated, it's bigger. Now we're saying we've reformed the system, we have living wills, we have insolvency regimes, and we're going to be able 
to break up these monsters or close them down when there is a next crisis. Nobody really believes that. This is something that's not going to happen. How are you going to break up or insult, in an orderly way shut down a JP Morgan or a Citigroup or a Goldman Sachs? So we have still a system in which actually those systemic issues are still there, and we've done very little about resolving these problems. So we have actually a worse problem right now. <clears throat> Well, Turner, your response to that, that uh, we're in exactly the same boat as you were a few years ago when the financial crisis began. We still have uh, a very serious uh, threat to the system posed by some financial institutions. Well, I think it's a very good challenge. I mean, if you go back to the situation that Jean-Claude described in autumn 2008, uh, as regulators, as authorities, we faced a very difficult dilemma with the big systemically important institutions. Either we allowed them to go into insolvency, and that's what happened with Lehman's, and that was a disaster, or the only alternative that seemed to be available for us was to put enough capital and liquidity in that we rescued them as they were and without any imposition of losses on debt holders who therefore uh, never faced the risk of the consequences of the decisions they'd made. And that was unsatisfactory and seen as unsatisfactory by the people who had to rescue these banks. And out of that came the debate about putting the stop to too big to fail. And I think it is an important debate. I want to stress it's not the only debate here. Uh, I do agree with Peter's point that actually you could have an unstable system out of lots of small interconnected banks. Let's remember that the US banking crisis of 1929 to 33 was broadly speaking a crisis of lots of small banks. There are issues about capital and liquidity across the whole of the banking system. There are issues about the fundamental instability of the asset and credit cycle which require a macro prudential response. It's also true that we shouldn't just focus on banks. We need to be very aware that the origins of the financial crisis of 2007 to 8 also lay in a set of things that we call shadow banks, the complicated interconnections of repo markets, money market funds, sieves, hedge funds. We know that that can be a source of uh, instability. So the issue of the big banks is certainly not everything, but it is important. They are peculiarly important within uh, the system. And in response, we've ended up with three things that we said uh, we're going to do. First of all, we're going to try and reduce the probability of them getting into trouble, and that's where the surcharge on capital, the global systemically important financial institution surcharge comes in, and I think that is uh, entirely justified. The second, and I think this is probably, to pick up Nouriel's point, the, the biggest challenge, we have said that we will find a way where we can resolve them uh, without taxpayer support and, crucially, without that leading on to a disruption of their fundamental core functions uh, in uh, society. And honestly, we're sort of work in progress there. That's the honest point. And the, this year, I think, is one where we've really got to push this forward. I think what we increasingly realise is that there are two visions of how we have to achieve that. There are probably some institutions which are those heavily involved in investment bank and trading type activities where the idea that we can break them up is actually very, very difficult because their attitude of the market towards them in terms of confidence is so interconnected. With those firms, we are fundamentally going to have to resolve them if they get into difficulty at a global integrated level. And I think we will have to make sure that they have enough potentially loss-absorbing debt, bail inable debt, debt that we can convert to equity, available at the group level, that in conditions of uncertainty, we can force that into equity and recapitalize them. I believe we will therefore have to move on to actually regulating that slice of the balance sheet, which we have not regulated before, beyond equity, telling banks of that nature that they will have to hold bail inable debt of a certain percentage of the balance sheet. I think there are some other banks, particularly those banks which are, broadly speaking, organized as holding companies of retail and commercial banks throughout the world, where there really is a model that we could break them up and that where we may make it absolutely clear that there is no one authority which will look after them, but in conditions of crisis, they would be broken up. And those are ones where we have to organize them locally, nation or by region, as subsidiaries, as fully capitalized and liquid subsidiaries, which are capable of surviving the breakup of the overall group. I think, and I'll leave it for later comments, I think we can do all that in a way that does not intervene with those advantages which do come in some ways from being large and cross-border. And I think I agree with some of what Peter said in that, uh, but I also think it can be overstated. My own point of view is that the steps that we are taking uh, to deal with the big bank issue, uh, important but not the whole of the story, will enable us to make them more stable, more safe, 
without interfering with those beneficial roles which some of them are playing. Ms Ortiz, what are your thoughts on that? Is it possible to make the system safer and sounder without putting profits or indeed growth in peril? Well, let me uh, react to some of the comments that have been made. First, um, I think that obviously the uh, regulatory community has reacted uh, broadly and appropriately to, to face this problem. But the question of the uh, you know, too big to fail uh, question, uh, I think I tend to agree with uh, Nuriel. You know? I mean, there is no way in my mind, and this, you know, as I said, it's work in progress, that you can actually uh, wind down orderly you know, a big complex institution. Uh, <clears throat> let me give you another perspective from the emerging markets uh, world. Uh, <clears throat> during the past crisis, and this is important, you know, none of the emerging markets that have suffered a crisis in the 90s or in the early 2000s had a domestic financial crisis as a consequence of the global crisis. Uh, the banks in the emerging world were much better capitalized. They did not get into toxic products and so on and so forth. And very importantly, the, uh, the subsidiaries uh, of the large foreign banks were isolated because they were, they were constituted under local laws. And they have their own capital. Uh, so uh, we, we faced a situation a little bit um, very, uh, very... Uh, very, I would say, paradoxical. In my previous incarnation as a central banker, one of the main discussions that we had in the Basel Committee and the Financial Stability Forum is what happens to the subsidiary of a bank that goes wrong. I mean, will the parent bank support it? No, it was the other way around. It was the subsidiaries of the large banks that were actually transfer capital and liquidity to the large banks. So I think that there's a lesson to be learned there. And uh, I think that we in the emerging market world you know, are very much aware uh, of the dangers uh, of uh, having a financial system which is dominated by foreign banks uh, in the current state of the world. It's good to get the perspective from the emerging markets, definitely. And Mr. Frieden, tell me, are we paying, a point that was raised, are we paying enough attention to shadow banking, to repo funds? Is our definition of institutions that can be a systemic risk to the entire economy or the entire system a little bit too narrow in this case? Probably yes, but I think we are aware of that and we have started on dealing more with uh, those issues as well, but we did it step by step. I think prior to the 2008 uh, events, and you're obviously listening to, um, to some of the speakers, we are still under the shock of 2008. Prior to 2008, looking from the political and probably also consumers' perspective, a lot of people thought that larger banks inspire more trust. Um, they were safer, they could better accompany companies uh, for bigger projects, and I still believe today that we need large banks. So I'm not against big banks anyway. I think it's very difficult to come up with um, a legal definition of what is a big bank. But as Jean-Claude Trichet rightly said, we are talking about systemically relevant banks. And that is always vis-a-vis -a, -vis a certain system. And in 2008, together with my colleagues, the ministers of finance of France and Belgium, we had to rescue, in my country, two systemically relevant banks. And the question is not whether we should abolish those banks, but to avoid that, in, that we have to come to such a situation whereby we have to rescue from a social and economic point of view such banks, the clients of such banks, to maintain the system and at the same time endanger the public finances of our countries. We are representing as ministers the taxpayers' money. So the question is, how can we make sure that the big banks are there and we need banks of different sizes, as I said, in a global economy, to company bigger companies in their, in their global projects, yet at the same time make sure through better supervision, adequate regulation, that we do not put into jeopardy uh, public finances if we have to come in. And obviously if banks are large, if they are systemically relevant, there is an extra responsibility for governments in order to make sure that they are well supervised. Once we have done that, of course we have not to forget that there are 
what uh, you referred to, the, the whole area of shadow banking, but I can tell you in the Council of Ministers of Finance of the European Union, uh, we are closely looking into those issues uh, as well, and I think we have to do so on a global scale, because it's obviously it's not limited only to the European Union. Mr. Trichet, let me get, let me get your reaction to, to some of what we've heard there. It's, it's, I suppose it's a dilemma that we're still facing. How do you help out banks? And we're still facing this problem here in Europe, a lack of confidence in financial institutions, uh, the belief in the markets that many of them do need recapitalizing. And if it comes to that, how do you boost the system without taxpayer money effectively, without public finances? Well, first of all, I think uh, that uh, it's a global issue, of course, that we are uh, dealing with. And uh, it is absolutely clear, as it was said by the speakers, that what we are trying to do at national, continental and global level is to reduce the probability of a collapse of a systemic, systemically important institution if it is unavoidable, and uh, I mean, we are in a world which is the world of market economy, so we always have to accept that events that are uh, not, uh, of course, uh, very agreeable to uh, observe and, and cope with can happen. So if there is nevertheless, despite the fact that we have reduced the probability of the collapse, if there is a collapse, then it should be as we should reduce the probability of having consequences that would be, have been uh, very adverse, both, I would say, on the taxpayer on the one hand and on the economy, national and global economy on the other hand. All what we are doing is directed to reduce those probability. Nobody would be foolish enough to say, now it's safe. It's absurd. Only Soviet Union could say that. So we are not in a world where you can say that. Now, I have to say that uh, what is being done in terms of resolution, in terms of uh, improving loss absorption, absorption capacity, is, in my opinion, good. I think that, and I trust that it's very difficult, of course, to identify those institutions that would be sufficiently complex, sufficiently interconnected, and perhaps sufficiently big, even if it is not the best criteria. Fully agree. Uh, uh, but, but we have more or less the sentiment that at the global level, we have, you know, some... And I don't want to, to, to give a figure, but under your control, there, I would say a little less than 30. 30. A little 30 less nine. than 30. <laughs> yeah, say that. And uh, I note en passant that at a global level, it means that it is an industry which is reasonably fragmented. Because as you just said, uh, it is absolutely clear that in a, a, a large deal of other industries, concentration at a global level is much higher doesn't mean that we are satisfied with that. I will also say I fully agree with what has been said on the fact that you have those which are individually systemically uh, uh, dangerous, potentially dangerous. You have the herd, and the herd is as dangerous as the individual. And we know that, and it is true for the banks. It's also true for the non-banks, as I dare said, and I fully agree with that. The systemic instability of a large part of the financial system is still there, and we still have to work a lot on that. Mr. Sands, if I can get the banker's view, if you like, on the various regulatory efforts that are underway right now, different reactions in different parts of the world. In Britain, we're seeing a possible uh, reversion to the old US model, if you like, of a wall between uh, certain types of investment banking, commercial banking. In the US, we have Dodd-Frank, while in the EU, the response has been largely to rely on Basel III with enhanced capital and liquidity requirements. What are your thoughts on this? Do you think that there needs to be perhaps uh, more coordination on a global level? Will it work to have all these different initiatives underway? And how does that impact your business? It would undoubtedly be extraordinarily helpful and much more effective um, to have greater coordination and coherence. Um, and uh, I'm very supportive of the thrust of Basel III. Banks undoubtedly needed more and better quality capital, and Basel III has also brought in a framework for the first time for liquidity regulation. It still needs work, but broadly speaking, it's moving in the right direction. And I would emphasize... Um, that the stuff around resolution and recovery, making it possible for banks to exit, to fail, is, I think, absolutely central and should apply to all banks because I don't think, actually, a priori, we ever really know which ones are systemically important. So let's have a regime that works for all banks. 
I think we should be realistic. Having big, complex, multinational institutions fail is never going to be easy. It isn't in other sectors either, but we should make it doable. And that's the aspiration um, we should set. And, and I do think that is a, a reasonable um, aspiration to set. I do think we, we do run a risk with the sort of profusion of different regulatory agendas at different levels of considerable um, unintended consequences and confusion. Um, which I don't think is in the interests of anyone. And just specifically on the um, proposals around sort of splitting up banks by structural change. We're a banker's bank. We work, because we're a big trade finance bank with payments, we work with hundreds of banks around the world. So we're assessing the risk of banks around the world, and we've been doing that for 150 years. The banks that we see fail, and the data completely supports this, tend to be small, regionally concentrated retail banks and wholesale funded, medium sized wholesale banks. But this appears to be exactly the kind of model of banking that the structural proposals of the ICB are actually putting forward. So I do think we need to be quite careful in thinking that um, structural change is uh, a panacea or necessarily going to um, improve the fragility of the system. Just a quick follow-up to that then. You mentioned, you made a comment there about unintended consequences. And are we starting to see signs of that with the banks here in Europe, ongoing deleveraging? Is regulation helping or is it just hurting lending? Well, I think you have to step back and say, what is the root cause of the problem um, in Europe? The root cause of the problem in Europe and the issues around confidence in banks is not actually an issue around confidence in banks. It's fundamentally an issue around confidence in the underlying competitiveness and fiscal position of the countries. And if the banks have to, as they have to, hold sovereign bonds, that affects their viability and people's ability to lend to them and have confidence in them. So the root cause here is the fundamental state of certain countries within the Eurozone. And we come back to a very fundamental problem. You are not going to have stability in the financial system if you don't have good monetary and fiscal policy underpinning that. All the capital and liquidity in the world in a bank doesn't help you if the country is in a desperate state. And so, um, the, but, but coming to your point about unintended consequences, it is inevitable when you are changing so many um, things. Um, so many aspects of the regulatory architecture that you will get outcomes that you didn't quite expect. And I don't think the regulatory community should be embarrassed or apologetic about that because when you change a lot of stuff in a very complex and dependent world, that's going to happen. What I do think, though, people should take on board is that in that context, you need to be adaptive. You need to say, oh, this hasn't quite worked out the way we thought. Let's change it a bit. And that's not giving in to lobbying or anything like that. It's just being sensible um, about it. And we've seen some of this in the context of um, the impact on uh, trade finance of all the Basel III stuff. And there have been some moves to modify that. And for the emerging world, that is crucially important. I think you're also seeing some unintended consequences in the uh, dynamics of funding markets around the world. Um, but, it, but, again, I'm saying we shouldn't, we shouldn't be surprised. You would, should expect systemic un, unintended consequences, but you should have a model of policy making that allows you to learn from those and adapt and make changes. Um, well, if I could just get the, the central bank, and Mr. Trichet's central banker's reaction to that, just picking up on that point that Mr. Sands was making there about the need for a sound monetary and fiscal policy to be in place... Is it, is it the responsibility of the central banks? Are they prepared to be the guardians of the financial system, if you like? Central banks have a decisive responsibility in terms of monetary uh, stability, if I may, and uh, that goes without saying. They have a message or messages for fiscal policy, but they are not responsible for fiscal policies. And uh, you know that, to take the example of the ECB, we have been adamant to tell governments permanently, including at times where complacency and benign neglect was more or less of the essence. Unfortunately, before the explosion of the uh, recent crisis, we were telling them, look, it's very, very important, and it's also very important that uh, the overall uh, policies that are pursued, including uh, 
competitiveness policies and so forth, and structural reforms are, uh, are made, but it is not the responsibility of the central bank. So uh, I have to say that in our own case, we maintain as much as possible, the observers are the judges, uh, the stability of the monetary part of the system. I have to say that monetary union in EMU ha can prove that it worked pretty well, I have to say, obviously, but economic union had uh, a lot of uh, defects, and uh, we, ha we have to correct that. It is the uh, unique opportunity that the crisis offers. Then you see your fault lines and you correct it. It was done by Latin America. Guillermo knows something about it because he was <laughs> at the helm of what was, what was done. Uh, it was done in, uh, I would say, in Asia recently. It was done in Canada. It was done in Sweden and Scandinavia. We have to do the job now to be in a good, sustainable path, particularly, I have to say, as regards macro policies, which are not in the responsibility of central banks in Europe. And I, I, would, I would say not only in Europe in the advanced economy as a whole, which have to prove that they are in a sustainable mode now. Well, in that case, let me get the emerging markets perspective on that from a former central banker, Mr. Ortiz. The role of central bankers then uh, and central banking policy in terms of maintaining stability within the system. Well, <clears throat> uh, let, me, let me say that, uh, you know, uh, most of the emerging markets uh, suffered financial crisis, very bad financial crisis in the 90s uh, and the early part of the century. And I think that um, we came away from those crises, first with, with a huge cost for taxpayers, <clears throat> second with lessons I think that were well learned. Uh, in fact, central banks, at least uh, in Latin America and in Asia, took it as a function, although it was not spelled in the law, the question of financial stability that now is very much in vogue. You know, and you have all these committees on financial stability in which a central bank and the regulators participate and so on. <clears throat> that was an integral part of the central bank function uh, in, the, in the emerging market world. And this is one of the reasons, I think, why the, uh, the shock to the system that came about the, uh, you know, with the big crisis uh, did not produce uh, a, uh, you know, a, 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 I would say a dislocation of domestic financial activity. The only dislocation came about through contagion uh, and also through the presence of foreign banks that were instructed by their parents' banks to contract. Uh, and that, that was felt, I think, across the emerging world. Uh, but um, uh, then again, I think that uh, central banks uh, have to play a crucial role, as they did in the emerging markets today in assuring financial stability. I think the key point, again, to be emphasized is the one that, that Jean-Claude mentioned at the beginning. We need a system that's safer. We need a system that... I mean, the industry, by definition, uh, is a leverage industry. It's subsidized by deposit insurance and so on and so forth. And the shareholders have limited liability. So the combination of these elements obviously you know, makes for more risk-taking that would be socially optimal. So this is, again, the job of Adair and the regulators you know, to find the right balance. Uh, uh, I think that, that uh, learning by doing in the emerging market is something that we learned some of these lessons. So, so I, mean, I mean, Lord Turner, what's your response to that? Central banks uh, do have uh, responsibilities, Mr. Ortiz was saying, but then, as Luke Frieden points out, uh, don't governments also need to make sure that they're exercising mm -hmm. some sort of supervision over these large institutions? Well, not to mention regulators like yourself. Well, I think there's a very important issue here which Peter has, has raised, which is that in the present situation, we need to be clear what you can expect from regulatory tools versus mm -hmm. fiscal and monetary tools. Um, we have now launched in the UK what is called macroprudential policy uh, through the Financial Policy Committee. And the idea of the Financial Policy Committee is that we'll use regulatory tools to limit the 
upswing of the credit boom by applying countercyclical capital or loan to value limits in the upswing, new mechanisms apart from the interest rate to take away the punch bowl before the party gets out of hand. What's interesting is that we've been launched as the FPC uh, when there isn't much side of a party going on. Indeed, uh, we'd like a little bit more uh, party activity uh, out there in the economy. And the thing which we've been really, frankly, struggling with is what is the role of macro prudential policy of the movement of regulatory levers uh, in the downswing when you'd like to actually, if anything, stimulate a bit of credit supply. Now, the theoretically easy answer is that what you do in the downswing is you remove the countercyclical things that you put on in the upswing. That in the upswing, you put on more capital, you put on more liquidity, you get to a very high level, come the downswing, you release those. The fundamental problem we have at the moment is that because we didn't have this regime in place for the last 10 years, we've never put in place the buffers which we can now uh, release. And so we are caught on a sort of horns of a dilemma of uh, struggling with the fact that uh, you could argue that we ought to, for the state of the uh, world economy, the European economy, be a little bit more relaxed about capital and liquidity, allow lending uh, to the real economy. But actually, it was quite clear in autumn last year that the fundamental problem which was driving a dangerous potential credit crunch was that the markets were not willing to lend money on an unsecured basis uh, to uh, the European banks. There was a, a funding uh, crunch going on because they were worried uh, about uh, the capital adequacy and the solvency. So your problem is that the situation in the cycle says you want to relax, but actually, if you did relax and you made your banks uh, more fragile, you, that could be the worst possible thing. But what I think that also illustrates is Peter's point that that dilemma cannot be resolved by the regulator alone because underlying that uh, is the fundamental problems of the Eurozone. And the fundamental problems of the Eurozone is this cycle between sovereign debt uncertainty and the banking system with a banking system which holds very large amounts of liquid assets. It's liquid assets as government bonds and which we in the past have said they should hold because these are risk-free assets. I think what we are waking up to, and maybe we should have been clever enough at an earlier stage in the Eurozone project to understand, that when you go ahead with a Eurozone, where you have individual countries with large amounts of debt who are no longer their own fully sovereign currency-issuing authorities, you have changed the nature of that debt. That debt is more equivalent to as it being state of California debt uh, than U.S. federal debt because it is not uh, underpinned by the potential quantitative easing actions uh, of uh, the U.S. Uh, federal reserve. And I think there are very major issues here uh, which can only be solved by a fairly deep federalization of the eurozone, including uh, moving towards uh, euro bonds and uh, features like that. And I think that's an important point to make. Uh, with this, as macroprudential regulators, we can try to get the balance right as best possible between progressing fast to a more stable system, but also being aware of the dangers of restricting credit supply. But we cannot resolve those problems ourselves. Part of them have to be resolved by the appropriate actions uh, of uh, the Eurozone leaders uh, in coming up with a future design of the Eurozone which is stable, and of course, crucially, by the actions of the European Central Bank. And I think we all recognise that the European Central Bank's actions uh, before Christmas with the three-year LTROs was absolutely fundamental to giving us this breathing space in terms of an extra degree of confidence in the markets which the political leaders have to seize to actually design uh, what is a long-term stable system for the Eurozone. We know we're going to open the discussion up to the floor very shortly, keen to get your questions. But first, I wanted to ask you, Mr. Rubini, listening to all of this, has anything happened since the financial crisis to make you think that maybe the banks can help us grow out of this? Um, well, we are in a difficult situation right now because um, on one side there is a recognition that we need more capital, uh, less leverage, more liquidity. In the short run, however, there is a severe disintermediation in the financial system, credit contraction, especially in the Eurozone, and economic growth is dynamic in the case of the Eurozone actually is entering a recession. So there is an ongoing debate right now in the Eurozone between now Germany and France saying maybe we should postpone some of those uh, capital liquidity charges and those in the UK who are saying, no, we should stick with them. I think it's uh, fundamental for the system to continue with building up the capital and liquidity because we have to build the system is going to be more resilient and we have to find other ways to jumpstart economic growth. Uh, I think in the case of the Eurozone, easier monetary policy, uh, 
uh, maybe fiscal stimulus in some part of the core can afford it. Uh, a weaker value of the euro could be policies that are going to lead to stronger economic growth. Right now it's contracting while you're building a system that in the financial sector is more resilient to the next uh, financial crisis. And this nexus between uh, sovereign risk and banking risk is unfortunately a serious one. You know, the banking risk became sovereign when we backstop, bailed out, and fenced the banks. But now the sovereign risk is becoming banking risk because a significant part of the government paper is in the hands of the banking system. You have a bunch of sovereigns that are either insolvent or near insolvent. They cannot save themselves, let alone save their own banks. And now we're in this vicious circle between the two that is exacerbating some of the economic contraction in the Eurozone. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to throw it out to the floor now. Are there any questions? No questions? Thinking about it? Yeah? Please. Bank, Specialist, diff different areas, break them up, is that, is that your solution? Um, my view of it is uh, somewhat controversial is that we should go at least in the United States back to Glass-Steagall, meaning after the Great Depression we decided to separate investment banking from commercial banking. It worked for about 50 years. We didn't have any severe financial crisis or banking crisis. We had at times you know, a single bank when in trouble and so on. And that system really started to create uh, financial imbalances of leverage, of excessive risk-taking, when we decided to phase out those kind of separation. You know, banks, by definition, have to be having guarantees of deposits and having land of last resort support because, by definition, they are in the maturity transformation business. They take short-term deposit and make illiquid loans and so on. So there is an argument for providing that support, land of last resort and insurance, and uh, deposit insurance for the banks. But giving that type of insurance and guarantee for the prop trading activity or investment banking activity of financial institution, in my view, doesn't make sense. That's why I'm in favor of breaking up larger banks and in favor of going to a separation between commercial bank and investment banking. That's not the view that's been taken by the official sector after the crisis. I think there's going to be another crisis, maybe the next crisis. We're going to talk seriously about going back to those types of separations. Yeah. So perhaps uh, not very cheerful. <laughs> uh, ben Chu from the Independent Newspaper. I've got a question for Lord Tur uh, for Adair Turner. Um, how would you respond to Peter Sand's point about the Independent Commission on Banking proposals? He said uh, they will throw up unexpected consequences, and he suggested that perhaps um, policymakers and regulators should respond to them. Um, do, you, do you think that's a valid point, and do you think the uh, recommendations of the ICB should be watered down? No, I, I don't think they should be watered down. I think they've come up with a workable way forward. I think, first of all, we must never imagine that it is a panacea, and that's a point I've, I've often made, uh, that uh, we will ring-fence the basic retail and commercial activities in the UK uh, from a wider set of wholesale activities or perhaps retail elsewhere, but let's suppose it was just wholesale investment banking. I think anybody who thinks that once you've done that, you can be indifferent to what goes on in the wholesale and investment banking spaces is forgetting uh, the huge role of Lehman's uh, in being uh, the proximate cause of the real acceleration uh, of the crisis in uh, October, September uh, 2008. So, what this really is, I see uh, the ICB proposals, just so people understand them, this is the Independent Commission on Banking in the UK, uh, chaired by John Vickers, which proposed not, to Nouriel's point, a full Glass-Steagall separation, that, but within an integrated banking group, you should have to have internal ring fencing, a, some separate uh, internal uh, legal entities with a separation of activities. And I see that fundamentally as increasing the resolvability. They are increasing the options available to the regulatory uh, authorities and the resolving authorities in the case of a uh, crisis. And I think that will be a useful uh, extra for us to do. I th also think that there's an interesting macroeconomic element of this which has not been uh, focused on, which I think is once we have those ring-fenced retail and commercial banks within the UK, some of our macroprudential tools may actually be located at that legal entity because those will be the legal entities which are the fundamental drivers of credit supply to households and small and medium enterprises. The final thing to say is th the interface between the retail and commercial bank, the, the ring fence bit and the other wholesale activities will not be a straightforward 
uh, a, a fence uh, uh, to supervise because there are some very subtle and complicated things when you get to treasury operations as to what is hedging versus market making uh, ver and customer facilitation versus proprietary trading. And exactly the same problems are going to uh, be, have to be faced in the US with the Volcker rule which fundamentally says you can't do proprietary trading. Proprietary trading is buying and selling things uh, to make money except when it is for hedging, market making or customer facilitation. Now you then need uh, some pretty good supervisory processes to try as best possible to work out where you draw that line. But I don't think it's impossible. And I think this is therefore, it's not a panacea, but I think it is a useful addition part of our armory of tools to make sure that these large complicated banks are to a greater degree uh, resolvable and indeed easier to supervise. Gentlemen, over there, the question. It is just a more ethical question, really, regarding how our capital marketing function and mean price. Do we really to trade every day or the frequency of trading with the market open for trading every day? If we just extend the trading for, say, one week, uh, one, once a month, because really this creates a lot of momentum. I'll just give an example. Apple over the last, uh, which everybody I think love, the value of Apple has changed almost like 20%. Does really the fundamental value of Apple has changed fundamentally by 20%? This creates a lot of momentum in the market. People are benefiting and taxpayers are paying the indirectly hedge fund, making profit, for example, in the Swiss franc, on the British pound. It's a more ethical problem. Do we really need a capital market that should be traded instantaneously on a daily basis? Who's that, who's that directed to? All right, Peter Sands. I'm happy to answer it. All right. Yeah. Robini, uh, to some extent. So we, could, yeah. we could all answer yeah. this question. All right, I have yeah. to say because it's a so philosophical one. It. I fully agree of the fact that technology permits today things that were absolutely impossible yesterday and are creating new systemic risks. That's absolutely clear. And we have to be prepared because the Moore law continues to function, perhaps uh, doubling every two years and not one year and a half, but we have to be prepared for even more dramatic changes in the functioning of IT, in the functioning of, uh, of communication, and therefore in the functioning of markets. And we cannot say we won't use technology, but it is really something which is a, of an incredible intellectual exercise to try to catch up with these new tools that are uh, permanently putting into question the wisdom of our own regulation, I have to say, and th that, that's true for uh, all what you said, but even much more. Let me only say that we are looking at it, and to, to go back to this systemic uh, responsibility of the central banks, I have to say on both sides of the Atlantic, in the advanced economy, this idea that the central bank would be a, a good location for the European Systemic Risk Board, for the systemic risk entity that uh, has been created in the United States of America with special attention, as said Adair, to macro prudential, is your, your question is also part of it. And, and we are working on this high frequency trading. Uh, we are working on a lot of elements that is creating perhaps potential systemic instability in a world which has proved already its fragility. And I will not say uh, like <laughs> Noriel, that we are in a worse situation than we were in 08. But I remember at the beginning of 07, we were not very numerous to say risks in the global economy are underpriced, risk premia are too low, volatility is too low, a market correction will operate. I said that myself in Davos five years ago. You were much more pessimistic and you proved right, Noriel. I would say today, we have as much hard work to make the system more stable, as Adair also agrees, than it, as it was the case uh, three or four years ago. I mean, it's, uh, and, and the technology is part of our problem, but also the herd. We don't understand yet how herd behave, and that is fun fundamental. Non-banks herd, banks herd, market participant herd, and th that, that is something where we need academia as well as practitioners. All right. Uh, Mr. Rubini, your response to that? Well, I would tend to agree with uh, Trichet. Mm -hmm. And on the issue of speculation and trading, I don't think you can ban it. I'm comfortable if a hedge fund takes risk of his own investor and does speculation. If they do well, they do well. If they fail, they fail. I'm less comfortable with using taxpayers' money. There's insuring deposits and so on. 
to allow financial institutions to engage in those kind of activities. And more broadly, of course, even if those activities are done by non-bank institutions, we have to think about potential systemic effects, like LTCM was leveraged almost 1,000 times, and it was a source of systemic risk. So we have to think about these issues and figure out what are the appropriate forms of regulation supervision, not just of traditional banks. As was pointed out, non-bank financial institutions, the shadow banks had a bigger problem because at least the banks had deposit insurance and uh, land of last resort support to prevent the run, while we had this whole scale run on the shadow banking system that was as leveraged as the banks, even more so in terms of short-term term maturity uh, of their debts and longer-term illiquid assets, and did not have either deposit insurance nor land of last resort, and yet the collapse of a good chunk of the shadow banking system. So expanding the regulation supervision to those non shadow banks is maybe part of the agenda we should be discussing as well. All right. Well, I'm, Lord Turner, you're nodding your head there. Is there something you want to say? Well, I, I agree with that, but I also wanted to just comment on what I think is a great question, because, I mean, there are two startling things about the financial system in the 20 years before the crisis. Well, there's many startling things, but among them there are two. One is a quite extraordinary increase in the amount of trading activity, where the amount of financial trading activity relative to the real economic flows to which you might think it bears some relationship went up by multiples. So if you work out how much foreign exchange trading what there was as a proportion of the size of long-term capital flows or trade flows, you know, you, you have a multiplication five, ten times. You have the same in commodity markets. Uh, you have lots of markets where there's just much more trading uh, activity. A lot of credit, uh, which had not previously been traded, become actively traded. And before the crisis, there was a very strong... Uh, belief within the economics profession that we knew that this was good because it was axiomatically good, because it was, quote, completing markets, and we know from the market efficiency hypothesis that the more markets you have, the more allocative efficiency there will be, uh, the more that risk will be shared, the better price discovery we will have. Uh, I, I think we need to have a much more nuanced approach to this. I think it's absolutely clear that liquidity of markets up to a point it is a clearly valuable thing. The world cannot work without a reasonably liquid foreign exchange market. Equity markets cannot work without the possibility of people coming in hour by hour, minute by minute, and buying and selling equities in reasonable quantity at relatively fine bid-offer spreads. But I think it's quite reasonable for us to ask, and I think we need to ask, searching questions in a way that we didn't before the crisis, is whether this is limitlessly good. Whether once you've got a reasonably active, liquid a, uh, a equity market, is there any real value in high-frequency trading, which appears to be doing some price discovery process at the nanosecond level uh, rather than at the second-by-second second level? Uh, I find it quite difficult to know uh, what real economy benefit that is actually giving. Now, as long as it is not also creating a financial stability disbenefit, then maybe we don't need to worry. But at least we should be more cautious than we were before the crisis of allowing sort of iconic words like liquidity and price discovery and efficiency of markets to be sort of things that made us back off and say, well, we can't interfere. We've, we've got to have a nuanced understanding of the role of trading activity uh, within the financial system. All right. Well, Ms. Ortiz, I know that you're keen to respond to that. Mr. Turner's comments there about liquidity of markets being very valuable, but you know, does it have, is that necessary limitless? But if you could keep your response brief. Well, I think that uh, uh, we're going into uh, the direction of, um, of asking whether, you know, financial activity and financial innovation, which is responsible in many ways for the very large increase in trade that I was talking about, is something useful to society or not. And um, I think that the acid test here is to ask yourself whether, you know, new products, innovation is something that benefits directly or indirectly uh, the, uh, the real sector of the economy, the households, whether it allocates, it helps to better allocate resources that are the fundamental uh, functions of finance to distribute risk better, or are we just talking about bets that are being taken in the financial sector uh, and have nothing to do uh, with the real activity. You know? So uh, it's very difficult also to distinguish and to, and, and to put a border there, but I think that uh, this is a, uh, an acid test and a very valid question. And uh, Peter Sanders, I'm going to get a very quick reaction from you. Um, well, as a bank, we don't do prop trading. All our trading is 
um, client business. But fundamentally, I think uh, deep and liquid markets are better than illiquid occasional markets. And indeed, mm. if you yeah. look at through the crisis, it was the illiquid markets that got us into trouble. Markets like FX and equities didn't so much get us yeah. into trouble. Well, thank you. Okay, short and sweet. Thanks very much indeed to our panelists. And so with those final thoughts, it's time to draw the Bloomberg Davos debate to a close. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank our prestigious panel and you, the audience, of course. From all of us here, goodbye.